Right. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind invitation to present at this, uh, this lovely meeting. Um, what I would like to do, though, is, is not to thank the organizers for the, uh, for the slot, the very first slot in the post-launch session, the so-called graveyard slot for speakers. So before I start my talk, may I just get an idea about how, how many of you are here in mind as well as body? So let's start with the first question. Right, so what is your post-lunch routine? Are you like electrophysiologists in Liverpool? So I'm used to working lunch, and so I'm wide awake. Or are you like some of our surgeon colleagues? I'm half asleep as I always take a post-lunch siesta. So please give your responses now. Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> okay, so half of you are still awake, and I'm I hope I'm not going to put that half to sleep by the end of this presentation. Okay, so can I have my first slide then? Right, so I've been asked to speak about avoiding vascular complications. Um, and that's not, that's not because I have the biggest experience of these, but hopefully, as, as we mentioned, we are, by virtue of the work we do in electrophysiology, we are always at risk of running into these complications. So vascular complications are a huge spectrum, starting from just a plain and simple painful groin hematoma, which leads to an unsightly bruise like this, to a pseudoaneurysm that might need a thrombin injection, to an arteriovenous uh, fistula, which might need surgical correction, to the most life-threatening of all, a, a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Now, how common is this problem? Do we really need to worry about it? So I have tried to put in this slide all the published studies on left atrial appendage occlusion. So I've tried to keep a threshold for a minimum of 100 cases to include in the slide. Now, as you can see, the range of vascular complications ranges from 0.7 to 3.5%, so pretty wide range. But what's more notable is the fact that a few of the studies haven't even bothered reporting vascular complications. It's not that they did not have vascular complications, they weren't looked for. And that included this very large, real-life US watchman registry of 4,000 patients. They didn't even look for vascular complications in that paper. So, I saw some systematic under-reporting in the literature. So clearly, if you don't look, you will not see. And even in those papers where mention was made of vascular complications, it was a line of max two lines at most. So it was very much a footnote. We all seem to be concerned more about tamponade and stroke, rightly too, but sometimes at the cost of vascular complications. And the other thing that I saw was something that is also there in AF ablation literature, that whilst the incidence of other complications such as periprocedural stroke and tamponade have reduced over time, the incidence of vascular complications hasn't. So that now, for AF ablation, the most common complication is vascular complication, so access-related complication. And perhaps these limitations in the literature were addressed by this consensus document that aims to uh, give some definitions, endpoints, and data collection requirements for all future studies in this field. And they looked at defining vascular access complications by including the various types, some of the examples which I've already shown you, for example, hematoma, fistula, so on and so forth. But also, there was an awareness in these guidelines that a lot of these vascular access complications can present after the patient has been discharged and gone home often at a time when the patient is most vulnerable. If there's a tamponade on the table, we can handle it. But if a patient develops a massive hematoma, day two, day three after discharge, then they're much, much more vulnerable. They often present to a local general practitioner. They often present to a, uh, to a local hospital, local a and &E. So this is something which was included in these guidelines that all vascular complications which occur within a week of the procedure should be included in the reports. But even then, if we just look at the headline complications such as hematomas, fistulas, etc., 
we may just be looking at the tip of the iceberg. If you look at patient perceived discomfort following heart rhythm procedures such as catheter ablation, as these, the, this group did, as many as 50%, so half of the patients complained of significant site pain post-discharge. A similar study performed in the United Kingdom sent out a postal questionnaire a month after the procedure, after AF ablation, and what they found was striking. As many as a third of the patients perceived that they had had a growing complications after the procedure. And that figure was 10 times higher than what the physicians thought the growing complication fi figure to be. So clearly, we need to be listening to the patients a bit more. Now, various risk factors for growing complications have been identified. Some of these are enumerated here. So age above 65, female sex, adverse BMI, heparin administration during the procedure, use of post-procedure low molecular weight heparin, large caliber sheets, multiple sheets, concurrent antiplatelet agents, or femoral arterial access or inadvertent puncture. Now, if you look at these, quite a few of these risk factors are inherently present in the kind of patients we treat and the kind of procedure a left atrial appendage occlusion is. So it's no surprise then that we often encounter quite a few of these complications. In particular, if you look at the femoral arterial access, now it's not only planned femoral arterial access. The big problem is inadvertent femoral arterial injury. And that is something which we had been interested in for a very long time in Liverpool. Now one of the things that struck us was that when we do AF ablation, almost every step of the procedure is guided by technology. Transeptal punctures, you use TOE. Left atrial catheter manipulation or delivering of lesions, you use 3D mapping. And yet when you start the procedure, you do it totally blind. It's just a blind stick, you go towards the vein, hopefully you'll hit it. If not, you know, you'll go again. If you hit the artery, you'll press for a little while, you'll go again. And that, and that just struck us as being absolutely ridiculous, especially with these patients who were then going to get heparin for several hours afterwards for the procedure. So we hypothesized that if you were to use vascular ultrasound to guide access, you will improve patient outcomes. So what we did, for a six-month period, we collected data prospectively on all patients in terms of groin complications immediately after the procedure, immediately before discharge from hospital, and then a month after discharge by sending out a bespoke postal questionnaire. Then the entire department agreed to move wholesale to using vascular ultrasound for AF ablation, and then we repeated that process for another six months while these data were collected. Both of these groups were pretty well matched because these were all comers, so about 150 patients in both groups. And what did we find? We found that patients in whom we had used vascular ultrasound had a much lower risk of inadvertent arterial puncture as identified by the operator. If the significantly lower rate of significant bleed requiring intervention, and during the time when ultrasound was used, we didn't see a single major bleed, i.e. patients requiring blood transfusion or surgical correction. Furthermore, when we followed up these patients after a month, there was a significantly reduced incidence of groin pain post-discharge, analgesic use post-discharge, or prolonged local bruise, bruising lasting for two weeks or more. And the absolute risk reduction was fairly remarkable. We only needed to treat 11 patients with vascular ultrasound to prevent one bark 2 plus bleed. We only needed to use vascular ultrasound in five patients to prevent one prolonged local bruise, bruising. So you might say, these are, these are endpoints that we cardiologists don't worry about but I would submit to you that our patients do worry about this. So perhaps we should be redefining what we call a complication. We looked at a learning curve, and there was some, but a very short one. So operators who had used less than five vascular ultrasound cases, their risk of causing a vascular complication was the same as people who had not used ultrasound. But once you had done 10 cases or more, then your 
incidence of vascular complications dropped dramatically. So it's a very short learning curve. It's just time well spent. So that led to a wholesale change in policy in Liverpool. From then on, we said no patient is ever going to have an EP procedure without using vascular ultrasound. And that was back in 2012. We changed the policy. And then we presented the results of all comers, all air fibrillation cases done in Liverpool between 2008 and 2012, compared to 2012 to 2015. We presented them at the cardiostim meeting last year. And as you can see, the overall incidence of complications of the air fibrillation has gone down. You would expect that. It's about 1% now. But the serious complications requiring intervention, so AV fistula requiring surgery, pseudoaneurysm requiring thrombin injection, they've been eradicated. Retroperitoneal hematoma, we've only had one in 1,600 cases. So highly significant decrease in major vascular complications. Not only that, if you look at other things which may be of more interest to our managers, things like early mobilization, early discharge from hospital, same-day discharge following an air fibrillation, all of those things are also helped a lot if you have a clean puncture. You don't have to use a fence stop. You don't have to, have a, you don't have to bother with a hematoma. And that experience has then uh, been extended to our amulet implants, or left atrial appendage implants as well. So we've done 85 cases, or we've attempted in 85, we've been successful in 84. We've had two complications, both of them device embolizations, but we haven't had any tamponade stroke or vascular complications. So, so, the, oh, machine, so I'm just going to show a very short video, just two minutes. Probe, so we just put that very gently onto the patient's groin, and you can see uh, that there is a, the idea is to make sure that the lateral side is lateral and the medial side is medial. As you can see, when I'm applying pressure, the femoral vein is getting compressed. And also you can see that the femoral vein is actually directly under the femoral artery. Now, what I find very useful in these cases is if I just scan it further up in the groin, and now if you see the... Um, the screen, the vein has become a bit more medial compared to the artery, so it gives you a clear path into the vein. So the general rule is the higher up your screen, the further apart the vein and the artery are. Having said that, they're still very close to each other, and you can see how if you don't use ultrasound, you're very likely to nick the artery on your way into the vein. So this is just the usual cell the needle. idea is to place the vein right in the middle of the screen, put the needle right in the center of the probe and then you can see the needle approaching the vein and there. I, I can, I'm not even looking at the needle but I know that I am inside the vein here. Okay. There you are. Now, to get the second one in is even easier because you have the first wire as the landmark. So here you are, you can see the wire go all the way from the skin into the vein, just medial to the artery. So again, put it right in the middle. There you are, secondly, so the subling the needle, you can see going in just medial to the old vein, uh, old wire, and there you are, and inside the vein. And that's it. Access achieved successfully and most importantly safely. Thank you. Hmm. So there you are. So a lot of people have this concern that this slows the procedure down. It clearly doesn't. It's actually very, very straightforward. Um, so we now have an ultrasound probe um, a machine in each of our um, cancer laboratories, and it's just become a part of the routine. Right, so um, Sobolov and colleagues attempted an, a meta-analysis for using vascular ultrasound for air fibrillation, uh, and they published it in Europace. They only came across three papers, including our own, but a huge one from Cleveland Clinic of 3,000 uh, odd patients. And what they found was the same thing as that we had found, that if you don't use ultrasound, if you use blind punctures, you have a 1% risk of a major vascular complications. So again, not a huge risk, but a 1% risk nonetheless. If you use vascular ultrasound, that risk is almost totally eradicated. So they surmise that the advantages of ultrasound-guided access were greatly reduce inadvertent arterial puncture, reduce minor vascular complications, but as I said, some of these may be significant, may be important for the patients, 
eradication of major complications requiring intervention, early mobilization, same-day discharge, and a very short learning curve. So, to summarize, my suggestion, my advice is simple. You know, we had a, we had a fantastic um, session in the morning with lots of latest technology, very, very exciting, cutting-edge technology. This is simple. This is something all of us can use. But this will reduce complications for all of us. So, vascular complications are inadequately reported, almost certainly because we don't appreciate the impact they have on patient uh, well-being. They're almost fully preventable by using vascular ultrasound. And I would argue that in today's day, it's almost legally indefensible to have a blind go, have a blind puncture. If you have a serious complication, it'd be a very difficult, uh, very, very difficult um, discussion with the opposition solicitor. Anyway, here we are. So I'm just going to end with two questions. The first one, please. So what is the strongest risk factor for femoral vascular complications according to you now? So age greater than 65, BMI greater than 35, use of heparin, ACT greater than 200 seconds, or attempting blind punctures without the use of ultrasound? Okay. Right, okay. Fine, so I've managed to convince at least half of you. And then one final question. Next one, please. Okay, so what is your experience um, of using fast to sound so far? So you already use it in all your cases? You use it occasionally only in case of difficulty in getting access? Or you have no or little experience, but you would like to try using it routinely? Okay, so let's have your responses to that as well, please. Right, okay, so I'm glad. So half of you use it when in difficulty. So there is clearly experience with the use of vascular ultrasound in this room, but uh, perhaps a third of you haven't used it but would consider using it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Now this was convincing. There is not much to debate, I would say.